Satyrs have been in D&D since the first edition, but it wasn't until the recent Mythic Odysseys of Theros that players have actually been given the opportunity to play one. A far cry from the mild manners of Mr. Tumnus, satyrs in D&D are all about celebrating life to its fullest. They're not concerned with the past or the future, only the ever-exciting now, and in that spirit, let's waste no more time in getting this episode on the satyr started. The first thing to know about satyrs is that they are true hedonists. They believe that life is for living and rarely think further ahead than their next meal. At their best, satyrs are joyous and whimsical, and at their worst, they're selfish and cruel. Most satyrs simply wander wherever their whims take them, following impulses and living off the land. When they do decide to congregate, it's usually for what they call a revel. Revels are parties, but where humans might celebrate for an evening with food and wine, satyrs can spend weeks indulging in every sensation imaginable before finally settling down in the rubble. Satyrs are half man and half beast, and it's the philosophy of the beast half that they embrace. For better or for worse, satyrs live for freedom, happiness, and excitement. Not all satyrs are entirely devoted to partying, though. Some form druidic circles devoted to restoring and nurturing wildlife. Some also become explorers, emissaries, and storytellers called dongrites. These adventurous satyrs spread stories and expound their carefree philosophies as far as they can travel. And finally, while they often balk at any sort of authority figure, many groups of satyrs are led by a sibyl. Sibyls are typically elder satyrs that have been blessed with a limited foresight into the future, a gift they use to warn other reveling satyrs of an impending danger. Satyrs are half human and half goat, though you can play around with those ratios quite a bit. The upper half of the satyr is generally the human half, topped with a pair of short horns, with a goat's lower body including hooves and a stubby tail. Their skin tends to be a tan to a light brown, and their hair often a red or chestnut brown. They usually have scruffy patches of hair along their forearms and shoulders, though this can range from their hair as fine as a human body hair all the way to coatings of fur. Like many other 5e races, these descriptions only fill in about 90% of the picture and leaves you basically the rest to kind of just go crazy, seeing as that 10% leaves you every possible variation of goat on earth to take inspiration from, the specifics of your character's appearance are really where it comes together. Satyrs tend to have a single short name, with most male names ending with us, and most female names ending with a or i. These names are given once satyr parents discover their child's personality. Satyrs often give each other nicknames as well, and given their playful nature, such names are often used more frequently than their real names. We'll throw some examples up here on screen so that you can know what we're talking about. Starting with your ability score increase, you get a charisma score of plus two and a dexterity score of plus one. Most Charisma casters also want a high dexterity for higher AC, so this stat line is absolutely perfect for bards, sorcerers, and warlocks, and also dexterity-based clerics and paladins. As for age, satyrs mature in age at about the same rate as humans, so nothing special there. And as for alignment, satyrs delight in living a life free of mantle of law, shall we say. They gravitate toward being good, but some have more devious streaks and enjoy causing dismay. The strong chaotic leaning will make it difficult to justify a satyr paladin, but bards, sorcerers, and warlocks line up just fine. Satyrs are slightly shorter than humans, averaging at about 5 feet tall. Their size is medium, and I would definitely recommend keeping this in mind only for role-playing purposes. They have a base walking speed of 35 feet, and that extra speed works wonders with builds that already want to move around quickly, such as barbarians and monks. And even without a special build, you can simply outpace most humanoid creatures. It's worth noting that satyrs are of the fey creature type as opposed to humanoid. Why does that matter? Because there are a lot of spells that specifically target humanoid creatures. As a fey, you're completely immune to spells like charm person, hold person, or dominate person. You're also vulnerable to some fringe abilities that may affect fey, but they're fewer and far between. Like most creatures with horns on their head, you can indeed use them for an unarmed strike. If you hit with them, you deal bludgeoning damage equal to 1d4 plus your strength modifier. Natural attacks aren't all that great in 5e, as we have covered on this show in the past, but they can come in handy in a pinch. One of the most unique abilities that they have is magic resistance. You have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. This is the ability that really puts satyrs over the edge into overpowered territory. You'll have advantage on about 90% of the saving throws you're called to make, which gives you a massive edge. Notice it says spells and magical effects, which is practically everything that isn't purely physical. The ability is strong and leaves little wiggle room for your DM, so abuse it to your heart's content. 
Another thing worth covering is mirthful leaps, meaning that whenever you take a long or high jump, you can roll a d8 and add the number rolled to the number of feet that you cover, even when making a standing jump. This extra distance costs movement as normal. A single d8 doesn't add a whole lot to long jumps when you're most often dealing with gaps in five foot increments, but adding a d8 to a high jump is a major modifier. A satyr with an 18th strength has a high jump range of eight to 15 feet from a standing jump. With this ability, you may well be able to clear obstacles and avoid threats that your DM was not expecting you to be able to. To me, the aspect of playing a satyr that's most fun is having stuff like Reveler. You have proficiency in performance and persuasion skills, and you have proficiency in one musical instrument of your choice. The biggest get here is the proficiency in persuasion, which can have dramatic effects on a campaign when used well. Performance and the instrument are more situational, but extremely flavorful. It reminds me of something like Miguel in The Road to El Dorado. These also line up with the bard's playstyle nicely and free up those skill proficiency options for other utilities like perception or stealth. Finally, you can speak, read, and write in Common and Sylvan. And just to clear up a common misconception, Sylvan is a very nature-based language, but animals do not speak it. Animals don't have a language in 5e, so don't think that satyrs can just go around talking to the wildlife. Sylvan is, however, a language that pops up a lot though, so remember that you have it whenever you start encountering druids or anything that feels particularly, let's say, nature-ish. Let's cover some satyr builds before we wrap this episode up, and as I always mention on this show, there is no right or wrong way to play the character that you want to play, but if you do care about optimization, we do have a couple suggestions, starting off with the Living Inferno. Warlocks already line up very well with the satyr's ability score increases, but taking the Fiend Patron can let you become a walking bomb. Your magic resistance applies to the spells that you cast as well, and once you reach 10th level, the Fiendish Resistance ability will grant you your choice of damage resistance every time that you rest. All you have to do is load up your favorite fire spell and grant yourself fire resistance, and feel free to just cast fireballs and stroll through the enemy ranks. A build more in line with the satyr lifestyle would be the Wild Magic Party Animal. Sorcerers want charisma and dexterity, but specifically as a satyr, we can abuse our magic resistance, and I recommend trying out a wild magic sorcerer in order to co-op this. The main downside from wild magic is the potential to hit yourself with some nasty magical ability, a downside that is largely negated by our magic resistance, and we have our Tides of Chaos ability as a backup. In exchange, you gain the potential for a ton of wild magic effects, and the Bend Luck ability makes you a powerful control caster to boost or negate the rolls around you. I have played this build personally, and can definitely vouch for its effectiveness. Mythic Odysseys of Theros is a new book, so only time and extensive playtesting will tell, but satyrs are potentially overpowered. Depending on how you calculate the strength of their abilities, satyrs easily have a stronger lineup of racial traits than most other options. The existing OP race option that usually comes up is the Yanti, and while I don't think satyrs are quite as strong, they're almost certainly in the same ballpark. Just be forewarned, I don't think that many DMs have had the time to really analyze satyrs as a racial option, but I predict that they'll soon be banned as OP at many tables alongside the Yanti. If you're a player considering a new satyr character, I just recommend that you talk to your DM and be completely honest about the potential for an OP character. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Be sure to like and subscribe because we put out new content like this every week. And if you or someone you know is creating a really interesting satyr character that you have run by your DM, I would love to hear about it down in the comments. Thanks again for watching. My name is Patrick Ferguson from Skull Splitter Dice, and until next time, farewell. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe so you never miss out.